Hey, everyone. Um, I'm a little short for this mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, I was, yeah, like Peter said, I was kind of thrown into this last minute. So forewarning, this will be a little less formal and um, a bit meandering. So just bear with me. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation around um, digital publishing and digital storytelling. And I should mention that I'm actually coming from a print background. Um, so I'm an artist who also happens to be an editor and publisher of several ongoing print publications. Um, and the books that I make aren't, um, they're not works of art per se, they're not um, books as art object, um, but rather I see books as just an extension of, um, a way to extend dialogue and discourse. And I think for all of you that might be kind of obvious, but um, for art that really means just taking that conversation outside of the gallery, outside of um, institutions, and make, bringing it into a more intimate space, um, and perhaps one that's also more permanent in terms of the lo longevity of a physical book, um, the idea that they can be revisited and passed along. Um, and so I, and while I like this idea of you know, having you know, free books for everyone to access online, I also have this you know, soft spot for printed books, one-of-a-kind ones that are just really hard to find. And in really thinking about what it is I love about books so much, um, I realized a lot of it has to do with um, the nostalgia and the romance of books. And one of the aspects is smell. Um, the Huffington Post published an article earlier this year that said that 92% of students prefer printed books over um, digital textbooks. And one of the reasons they cited was the smell of old books, that they really loved um, the smell of old books. And that's something I totally get because um, you know, I, I love the way old books smell. Um, and um, you know, I, I even like it when it's you know, a little sticky, a little grimy, and um, that you can you know, tell if the person who's owned it before you was like a smoker. And you know, it's kind of gross, <laughs> but um, at the same time, there's just something pleasurable about um, the smell of books. And, and I love the smell of new books as well, freshly printed ones. Um, and so when we're thinking about books, there's, um, it's more than just the information that's on the page. Um, there's also the feeling of paper. Um, like there, you know, it, um, there, there's like the cheap sci-fi paperback, you know, um, feeling of paper that's just like really on shitty paper. Um, and the ink is kind of rubbing off on your fingers maybe, but it's, it's really great and it, it's definitely memorable. Um, and I, I think this is the same reason why person-to-person -person conversations are still valuable and important. Um, it's you know because there's things that are beyond the visual that form our communication with one another. So as we're sitting here, you know, our bodies are transmitting smells, they're transmitting heat and bacteria and maybe viruses and hopefully not viruses, <laughs> but, um, but there are things that are, um, you know, beyond the visual that um, aren't readily available in the digital format just yet. Um, and so a question I'm raising is, is it possible to transfer some of that textural and olfactory senses into um, books in VR that maybe prompt that nostalgia? And um, in thinking about this, I'm imagining that it could be something like uh, Project Nourished, which is um, by Jin Su An. And this is a VR AR culinary experience. And basically you have this VR headset on and then you have these slabs of jelly, which are made of algae. Um, and this appears in real life, but in VR, you know, it appears as a delicious steak or, you know, really yummy looking pie. Um, and the idea is that you can eat anything that you want um, without the consequences. Um, but most importantly, there's this aromatic diffuser, um, which of course shapes the way that things taste. So I'm imagining, you know, we could very well do this for books. Um, we could have different text appear on empty pages and we could play with the texture of books. Um, in Dorothy's talk earlier today, she mentioned, you know, heat-sensitive paper. 
Um, and we could also have this aromatic diffuser, which would release the smell of old books, maybe. Um, and, and there's a lot of experimentation going on in um, AR books. And this is something I just recently um, stumbled upon, which is um, a publishing company called um, Antiism Publishing. Um, and they have a new series um, that's titled AR Books. And these are still forthcoming. Um, but the idea, as you can see, is that artists can um, you know, take the publication format one step further by sort of physically inserting their, wor their work directly onto the page via AR. Um, and you know, again, this is super exciting and really fantastic, but I'm not convinced that it, it's um, capturing the sort of nostalgia that, um, that goes into books. And um, so for the purposes of this talk, it seems like you know, perhaps I'm taking a, a realist position if we were in the movie Extazens. Um, which is maybe a little anti-VR, anti-technology, but um, it's just one that I'm taking for the purposes of um, you know, this argument. And um, because at the same time, I do want to stress that it's actually because of technological advancements that more print-on-demand and short-run books um, are you know, really able to thrive. Um, and it, the digital printing op, um, options that are available are much cheaper than Offset um, would have allowed. Um, so in, in thinking about technology's relationship with books, I think it's also important to think about how they're changing the way that they're being physically printed as well. Um, and so one of the publications that I run is uh, an annual journal called Nonsensical. And I published this with two other artists, Polly Hakur and Alice Wang. And it's a compilation of experimental and critical writings by visual artists. Um, so basically, it's like a literary journal, but with text written by artists. And you can imagine how wide the audience is for that. Um, but uh, these issues are um, designed by um, uh, Taya Lortensen, who's a graphic designer um, based in New York. And she's really had fun um, playing with the limitations of what we can really affo afford to produce. Um, this is our second issue, which was themed meaning. And it's bound on both sides so that you can open the book from both ends. Um, you can mix the pages up, and thus meaning is scrambled. Um, this one's really cool. <laughs> Physical books. Um, and this is our um, latest issue, um, Wrong, which will be cut an angle. It's being produced right now. And our launch party is in two weeks in LA. So if you're there, it's at Art Book at Hauserworth and Schimmel. Just plugging that. Um, so, but the question of um, going digital is one that I do think about a lot because um, you know, just quite honestly, it would be so much easier to have this be online. It would be much cheaper. More people would have access to it. Um, there's not really good rational explanation I can find for, um, you know, making books. And it's definitely, you know, financially, it's, it's definitely not rational. Um, but, you know, we're not alone in this sort of, you know, um, desire to create books. And this can be seen at um, the more, you know, there's um, more and more art book fairs that have popped up. Um, and so this is Printed Matter. And um, Printed Matter is a nonprofit bookstore in New York. And they've been running the New York Art Book Fair for 11 years now. Um, and they've also organized the LA Art Book Fair, which um, has been happening annually since 2011. And each year, the attendance has really been increasing. Um, last year, um, I think over uh, 39,000 people attended, and these are free and open to the public. And this has really sparked a worldwide um, interest in organizing art book fairs. Um, there was one in San Francisco earlier this, this year that that was the first time that happened. Um, and there's been ones in Detroit, Vancouver, Tokyo, just all over the world. Um, so clearly print isn't dead and, you know, books aren't going anywhere. And there is this growing interest in both making and consuming printed books. And part of the appeal is the tangibility that I talked about earlier. But I don't really think that the material aspect is, is all that's drawing people into um, printed books. And this brings me to my next point, which is that 
Most of the books at the art book fairs are limited editions and short runs. And for the books that I publish, I've never printed more than 200 copies of each. So it's really not even a small press, it's tiny. Um, and I know this question was brought up earlier um, this morning, which is about accessibility. And um, I, I would say that for me and for a lot of art book publishers out there, it's, it's not that we're intending or we want to make this some exclusive thing and just like jack up the prices and make them limited editions. Um, but it's really just the cost of this, you know, this is you know, out of our own, own pockets and, um, and the audience of this is really small. So um, we're just working with what we've got really. Um, and so while digital publishing is being pushed for, with the aim of reaching a wide audience, um, an audience that can also be tracked and measured, um, I think the appeal of books, and in art books in particular, is precisely because they are produced, being produced at such a small and limited quantity, um, and making them unique and special. Um, and so part of the experience that adds to the nostalgia and adds to the romance of books is really in how we discover them. And a lot of times that requires some form of spontaneity. And it's a, you know, a similar pleasure that you get maybe when going to um, the $1 section at a record store and finding something that is just a gem. Um, I remember finding an album called Children's Music for Adults, Volume 1. Um, and <laughs> that could have gone really wrong, but it ended up being this experimental music compilation of um, musicians using children's toys as instruments. And it was really brilliant. Um, and here I'm also thinking about this scene from the beginning of uh, the movie Neon Demon. And it's in which Elle Fanning's character, who's this young model who just moved to LA, goes, she goes into this um, building to see a live art performance. And um, this is the performance. And this scene is really quite mundane in many of the ways, but I think it aptly captures um, the experiences that I've personally had in LA, just going to performances or seeing art in like the oddest places, um, in people's basements, at the observatory, private homes, on the street, in the desert. Um, and these are all very temporal events that if you just missed, you, you wouldn't even know about them. And so in this context, I like to think of um, books in the same way. And it might be romantic to think that, you know, maybe 50 years from now, someone will find a copy of Nonsensical in their, like, grandmother's collection. Um, but there's all these um, aspects around books that really shape our experience and our love for them. Um, and so the question I present to those who are working in the realm of digital pu publishing is, you know, what are the ways to make this kind of discovery possible? one that's you know, spontaneous and enjoyable, that's beyond the app store, that's not overly curated or heavily edited, as um, Dan mentioned in his talk. And I think part of this relies on a sense of uh, unpredictability. And the internet is really um, great for that because part of why the internet is enjoyable is because of um, its unpredictability and that you can you know, fall into these random rabbit holes. And there's a couple of artists who come in mind who make work um, that um, find these moments in the digital form. Um, this is work by a San Francisco-based artist, Anthony Descenza, and it's a part of his image search series, which he's basically um, recreated screenshots of his Google image searches. And the term that he searches for isn't disclosed, but of course what's interesting about them are the results which really seem random in their juxtapositions and pairings. Um, they seem as if you know, he's gone to like you know, page 16 or page 34 of the, um, your search and where it gets kind of weird and funky. Um, and he sees these as photographs, as um, a, capturing a specific moment in time because of course search results are constantly changing as new information is being uploaded online. Um, and I also want to uh, mention the unpredictability that exists in Twitter bots. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there are, there's a community of folks who make Twitter bots for artistic purposes. Um, this one is Tiny Starfield by Katie Rose Pipkin, and it tweets out a random placement of symbols every three hours to form a starscape. 
And this is Tiny Emoji, or Tiny Gallery, um, which is a popular one by Emma Winston. And it tweets out a gallery that has different emoji artwork and um, different emoji people who come to visit. Um, and because these are computer generated and completely automated, there is a sense of uh, joy and excitement in kind of each iteration. You know, whenever they pop up on your Twitter feed, you never know what to expect. Um, and of course, there's actually also text-based bots, which I'm not showing. But I thought I'd um, bring this one up, which for folks who are working in digital collections, um, the New York Public Library has um, two bots, NYPL dogs, and they also have cats. I think the cats has more followers. Um, but the bots are um, basically connected to the library's database, and they tweet out photographs from their public coll collection that contain the word dog or cat in them. And again, this is with the idea of encouraging people to discover and you know, stumble upon their collection and archive. Um, so all that you know, this is, is, is really just that there's um, small gestures that are taken that can produce a sense of wonder. And they produce a sense of wonder precisely in that they are small. Um, and in the discovery of them makes it enjoyable. Um, and so instead of thinking up about books as something that, you know, we're transmitting information that needs to reach a wide audience, um, I think it's worthwhile to think about the multi-dimensional properties of them that, that make them um, pleasurable and how, how to um, translate that into a digital format. Thanks.